Amen. It's hard to see what you're looking for if you don't really know what you're trying to find. It's hard to see what you're looking for if you don't really know what you're trying to find. My mother tells me I have a uh, hereditary condition that has been passed down to me. My mother and grandmother say all the males in my family have it, and this is how it works. Let's say some night uh, my wife Cheryl's cooking dinner, uh, and she's going to make some pasta. And as I'm coming in the house, she might say, hey, could you go into the pantry and grab the pasta uh, for me to cook tonight? And I'll say, sure, honey, and I will go to the pantry. I will look in the pantry. I will move boxes out of the way. I'll look up and down the pantry again. I'll start to go back to Cheryl, but I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to look one more time, and I'll check the pantry. One last time, I'm already seeing wives elbowing their husbands. Perhaps you have this condition as well, gentlemen. Uh, and, and then I'll go to my wife, and I'll say, Cheryl, we're out of pasta. We're going to have to come up with something else tonight. And Cheryl will walk right over to the pantry, pull out the pasta without even looking, and then get back to work. My mother calls this male pattern blindness. Uh, it's re- it's, it's uh, related to, uh, to uh, refrigerator blindness, another condition I know some of you uh, suffer from. Uh, and uh, I was prescribed a see-it-all uh, from, uh, no, I'm just kidding, of course. What's really happening, and we've all experienced this, maybe not with pasta, maybe not husbands and wives, but in some way where it's like it was, should have been right before us, and we just couldn't see it. And the reason Cheryl was able to go right in the closet uh, and, or the pantry and find what she was looking for is she had an image of, in her mind that she should be looking for something. She knew the color of the box. She knew where she usually put it. If she put it under or over or in between something because she's the one who put it away. She knows exactly what she's looking for. When I'm going in there, there's no image in my mind. And so I'm looking for the word pasta. I don't really know what I'm looking for. And so I don't see it. Or maybe my mom is right and it's really some kind of condition I have. I don't know. Uh, either way, uh, it's important that that's an important concept for us because it applies to God as well. Like if we are not looking and knowing to look for God working all around us, in all the situations of our lives, we will end up not seeing how God is working in us and through us and the people around us and all around our, our community, country, and world. We will miss the things that God is doing. Something that is especially important in times of difficulty, in times of challenge. So how do we open up our spiritual eyes? How do we gain a spiritual perception? How do, we, how do we go to God and see things from his perspective and see how he was acting in the world around us? That is what we're going to see today uh, in the book of Mark. So you could open up there. We've been in a, a series in the book of Mark. Uh, we're going to start in Mark chapter 7 today towards the uh, end of the chapter there and then get into chapter 8. And uh, this is how we're going to approach it today. We're going to first see what our problem is with spiritual blindness and lack of understanding and get a clear picture of what that is. And then we are going to understand God's solution for our problem. But we're going to read through the passage like we normally did. But this passage has kind of an interesting structure here. Uh, Like many of the stories in Mark, there's actually five stories here that all add up to a whole. And in this this passage, this section right here, has something called a chiastic structure. Uh, It's a literary term, a chiastic structure. This is how it works. You would have A, idea, then you would have the next idea, B, and then you would have C, and then you would have a variation back on B, and you would end back with the A idea. Sometimes people call this like a story sandwich, that Mark has taken a bunch of stories, and at the edges, the bread is one idea, and in the middle, the meat is another idea. And so I'm going to read in the order that the text is, but understand that we're really looking for the middle to be able to interpret the outside edges, okay? All right, let's start reading. Chapter 7, verse 31. Then he returned, he being Jesus, then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis, that is, the ten cities. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue and looked up to heaven and sighed and said to him, Ephaphatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened. His tongue was released, and he spoke 
plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. Now, we've talked a lot about this, Jesus telling people not to tell them about the miracles. There's a couple reasons for that, one of them being that, uh, that it wasn't time for him to kind of be fully revealed, especially to the leaders of the day, because they were going to kill him uh, as that found out. But how many of the people listened to Jesus' advice? Hey, don't tell anybody. Did anyone listen? Yeah, nobody listened. Because their lives are changed, and that's what happened here. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now, I'm not going to comment more on this now because this is part of the bread of that story sandwich, okay? So when we get to the, the bread at the bottom of the sandwich, we'll go back over this and talk about it a little more. I will say this. A man comes to Jesus uh, with, a, with a hearing problem, a problem with perceiving the world around him. Jesus heals him, and his life is changed so much that he has to tell everyone around him the exact same pattern as all the people before him. But now we're going to kind of get into the meat of the story sandwich here, and we're going to get to that idea of our problem with spiritual perception, our problem with spiritual blindness, and we're going to see it with the Pharisees, we're going to see it, or I'm sorry, we're going to see it with the disciples, then we're going to see it with the Pharisees, and then we're going to see it with the disciples again. And so we're looking here to understand what is our issue with spiritual perception and if you've been walking through Mark with us, this is going to sound super familiar. Verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 1. In those days when, a, again, a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had, very, uh, they had few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. All right, this is a story that should sound pretty familiar. Just a couple of weeks ago, we read over the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And a lot of the details are exactly the same, including some of the wording. In both cases, the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus uh, took just a few loaves and fish and, and fed thousands, uh, many of the details are exactly the same. That Jesus had compassion on them, the same exact wording. That they were in a desolate place, is how the disciples described it here. That's in both places. The fact that he ha didn't have enough bread, but then broke it, and somehow it fed 5,000 or 4,000 people, exactly the same. And that they had basketfuls left over. Different amounts, but still more than they could possibly have. Now, if you were with Jesus and saw 5,000 people fed, miraculously, and then you come to another situation where there's this multitude and Jesus is like, we're going to somehow have to feed all these people, what would you expect to happen? You'd be like, oh, Jesus is going to miraculously feed all these people again, right? But is that what the disciples say? They're like, no, we don't have any bread, Jesus. We're in this desolate place. What are we doing? And we see that the disciples are just not understanding who Jesus is. They've already forgotten this amazing miracle that Jesus had done not so long ago. I mean, even, if, <laughs> even when we train our kids, by, by the second time we show them something, there's at least some like light bulb that goes off when we're teaching them. Even if, you know, it takes a little longer for them to get it. There's some recognition that they're in the same situation. But now with the disciples, they're lacking understanding. They're just not seeing it. The reality is that sometimes we could see God do something one time, but forget he's almighty. Forget he's all-powerful. Well, the, the disciples haven't quite discerned who Jesus is yet. That's actually coming up, so there's hope for the disciples and for us. Uh, that, that's coming up. They do have a clear picture of who he is going forward. 
they're just not there yet. They're, there's some barrier there. There's some, they're, they're looking at the world in worldly terms, not through the supernatural terms that Jesus is presenting them. Now, Jesus addresses this more, but we need to get on to the next piece of meat in our sandwich because we're going to see an even worse example and something that we're going to be able to relate to a little bit of spiritual blindness. Let's, 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 keep, let's keep reading. Verse 14. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he, Jesus, cautioned them. Oop, no, I skipped the story. Sorry, we're in verse 11. My apologies. Verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, and seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given this generation. And he left them and got into the boat again and went to the other side. Our little background, the Pharisees are these critics of Jesus, the religious leaders of the day. They don't like how popular Jesus is becoming. Jesus criticizes, criticizes them uh, pretty hard. They criticize Jesus for uh, his teaching and that, that Jesus doesn't keep to all the traditions that they would like to, to him to keep. And so they kind of come to him and challenge him, and they look for, for a sign from Jesus. Okay, Jesus, you're doing this. Show us a sign that you really are sent from God. And it says Jesus sighs deeply in his spirit. I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe Jesus is just like, oh, you know, rubbing the bridge of his nose kind of sigh. Because here's the deal. The Pharisees have already been seen signs from Jesus. Jesus has been going throughout the land. He's been healing everybody. He's been casting out demons. He's been doing miracle after miracle after miracle. And the Pharisees and the scribes have seen some of these already. In fact, as back as chapter 3 in the book of Mark, they were there to witness the, the healing of a, of a man with a withered hand, despite their objections. So the thing, the thing here is not that they're actually asking to see any kind of sign for Jesus. They're asking for another sign despite what they have already seen. And Jesus responds to them, there's not going to be a sign. That doesn't mean that Jesus is doing no signs and no miracles. It's, it's that he, Jesus is not going to produce some more sign for them that would somehow produce spiritual sight or understanding from the Pharisees. And here's what I think the problem with the Pharisees is. I don't think they want to know. I don't think they want to understand. I think they are very comfortable where they are, with their perception of the world, with their comfort as being the religious leaders in their culture and society, and they don't want to see, and they don't want to understand. And so they don't see, and they don't understand Jesus' miracles, despite all the regular people, all these healings that we're seeing, people having some insight to Jesus' Jesus's personhood, even if it's just a little bit. And I think this is the temptation for all of us, that to believe in Jesus, both whether it's for your salvation or just as you walk through this life, to trust him each way is going to mean sometimes it's going to disrupt our comfort. That if we believe Jesus is who he says he is, and we believe he is active and working in the world around us, it's going to change things on us sometimes, and we are people who do not always like change. We see that when Jesus heals people, it changes their lives. But maybe we're comfortable where we are, like the, the Pharisees. They're comfortable with, in, in their power. Or maybe, maybe, maybe trusting in Jesus in some area would mean we would have to confront some sin in our life that we are very comfortable sinning. Like, we don't want to touch that. We don't want to get near the consequences of whatever that sin issue is in our life. And so we choose not to see. We have the temptation to choose not to understand what, who Jesus is and what he has called us to. You know, I was, uh, years ago, when I was, I think I, I think I was in seminary at the time, I was training to become a pastor, and I was sitting down with some family uh, friends uh, back at home, and I hadn't grown up in the church, and they knew that, and here I was now, training to be a pastor, and it was a real shock for them, but we had a really good and honest conversation with them. I really appreciate it. Sometimes when people hear you're going to be a pastor or are a pastor, and they're, 
they're not going to say anything to you about what they think about the Bible or Christianity or spirituality or any of those things. It's just how it happens. But they were just, you know, I'd grown up knowing them, and so they were very open. And at one point, uh, one of them w- w- was saying something to the effect of, you know, if it, the only way I would believe if God kind of opened up the heavens and just showed me, or if God somehow came down to earth and I could just see that he was here with my own eyes. I was thinking, man, he did, and not everyone believed. And I wasn't knocking her. I said this kind of in my head, but I had this thought like, would you though? Like if you don't want to believe, even if he showed up here at our dinner right now, would that really change your mind? Would you believe in that moment or would that just be, you know, you thought you were going crazy or something? If you don't want to believe, maybe, maybe you won't. And it's not that God doesn't want us to see what he is doing all around us, how he is active in our world. As many times we don't want to understand what he is saying and doing. And there's people who don't want to understand what he is saying and doing in the world around us. And we kind of keep ourselves spiritually blind because trusting in Jesus, seeing him for who he is, changes our lives for the better. But sometimes we don't like change. Well, it's not, as I've said already, it's not just the Pharisees that are having this trouble. It's the disciples next. And Jesus really kind of confronts the disciples on their lack of spiritual insight. He kind of goes back and explains, like, why did you guys not understand what was being done when I fed the 4,000? That's the next story in our sandwich here. Uh, Verse 14 now. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Now, you may be saying, okay, what's the leaven of the Pharisees? What's the leaven of, of, of Herod? You know, this, this, uh, this version of the gospel actually doesn't get into it. It doesn't get into it. The disciples aren't really engaging with Jesus. He's trying to teach them a spiritual lesson. Yeah, maybe they don't have bread, and so he, he's like, okay, I'm going to use that kind of teach you about the leaven of the Pharisees and the, and the leaven of Herod. But he never even gets to explain it because the, the, the disciples are like, oh, we're out of bread. Hey, did you realize we're out of bread? Man, we're out of bread. Where are we going to get bread? I don't know how we're going to eat. We're going to starve here. We're going, to do, we're going to starve, we're going to die, trying to serve Jesus. And all they're worried about is their bread. Uh, now, if you read other, uh, other of the, the Gospels, this leaven of the Pharisees, this is the idea that their corruption kind of penetrates everything. That hypocrisy doesn't kind of stay in one area, it kind of works its, through, its whole way through the dough or, or, or through the bread as it rises. And therefore, if we, are, if we let hypocrisy begin kind of leaking in us, then it'll spread everywhere. But actually, this, this Gospel doesn't go into it Because Jesus is trying to teach them something. So verse 17, And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? And having ears do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketful of pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the 4,000, how many basketful of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? He's like, listen, what are you worried about? Why are you worrying about bread? I've already produced whatever bread we've needed to do our ministry. I fed the 5,000. I fed the 4,000. Why are you worried about bread rather than these bigger spiritual issues that Jesus is is trying to inform them and share with them and and tell them about. And here's the the disciples disciples issue. That they're letting the concerns of this world kind of crowd out their spiritual vision. And we do this too. What do we worry about? Maybe we're not worried about bread in, in the boat with Jesus. What are we worried about? Oh, man, the gas prices, the gas prices, right? That's what we worry about. Or the, the, the politics. Oh, and let me tell you, more politics is coming. We got that midterm election coming up. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm tired. I'm still recovering from the last election. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. But like, right, that's what we worry about, the politics. Ah! And in and, and doing that, we let the concerns of this world crowd out 
what God is doing all around us each and every day. Now listen, I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned about gas prices if it's making you rework your family budget. Some people are feeling a pinch. I'm not saying it's not serious. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be involved in politics at all, uh, be completely separate. No, like we're called to be good citizens and can be involved in that. But we can let the concerns of the world crowd out our spiritual vision so that we are missing the fact that God is working around us each and every day. And that is what he's trying to tell the disciples. But, but do you believe that God is working in our world today? Right? Do, do, you, do you believe that he is changing lives, that he is working out his plan of redemption? Like we can't let the concerns of this world crowd it out. We can't ignore them. We can't let them crowd out seeing what God is doing all around us because God is active in our world. God is not some absentee landlord that just sent like the world going, like started, started it rolling down the way and just, I'll oh, see how it works out. Let's see how these humans work it out. That's not the picture in the Bible at all. That God sent Jesus for us. He died on the cross for our sins and was raised from the dead. And that he is active in our world today by the power of his spirit. That people are coming to faith and knowing Jesus and having eternity secured each and every day. That he is changing lives and, and, and growing people's faith each and every day. That he is helping those who are hurting and in need. I have seen this firsthand. Uh, you heard Jim pray about Shane Holdeman finally out of the hospital. Man, that guy has been through a tough time. And I saw it firsthand in my visits to him time after time again. The thing that kept him going was his faith. In Jesus and that God was with him. And I saw Shane on some low, low days. And I saw some days when he was inexplicably just hopeful and sure that he was going to make it through. So he also says thank you for all his prayers. He still has a lot of follow-up surgeries, but he is home and resting. The fact is this, God is working. And we can't, can't let the concerns of this world, like if we only think the world is operating on this physical plane, we're going to miss out on what God is doing all around us. So how do we get our eyes opened up? How do we open up our eyes to what Jesus is doing right now all around us? We got one more story in our sandwich. We're going to talk about the bread now. We get these, hit these two healing uh, miracles. Let me read verse 22. And they came, to Beth, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly, and he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. The fact is that Jesus helps open our eyes to the spiritual reality of our world. It's Jesus who opens our eyes to what he is doing all around us. Uh, he did it with the man. It wasn't his eyes. It was his hearing. So maybe you say Jesus opens up our perception to the spiritual world around us. But to the man who had hearing loss at the very beginning of the story, he restored his, his hearing and his life was changed. And now we have this other story. This story is a little different. And it's very unusual among all the miracles of Jesus. Most of the time we read about the miracles of Jesus, uh, someone comes to them, boom, they're healed, all set, done. But this case is a little different. It's like a two-part healing here, very unusual. I think there's a purpose behind that, especially the, the, because of the inner part of the sandwich that we've been reading about. That sometimes, uh, well, let me, let me say, say this about the story first. Jesus heals them like a little bit first, and he says, they look like trees walking, so the man must have had his sight before and lost it sometime in his lifetime. And so, Things were still a little blurry, and it's like blurry like trees kind of walking before him, I think, is the, is the idea there. And then Jesus heals him again, and he is fully healed. He could see clearly, is what the text says. I think sometimes we are in a journey of spiritual clarity. Like, maybe we see a little bit, but there's still more work for Jesus to do in us. 
And so I don't want any of us to despair when we see, you know, I mean, you've all met these people who are really mature in their faith, really spiritual, aware people. They just see how God is working all around them. And you're like, why, why, why is my sight not like that? I mean, I'm asking God. I'm asking for help. I want my eyes opened. What's the difference there? And the difference is maybe we're still in process. Maybe we still need to ask God for a little bit more spiritual discernment, a little more spiritual sight. Like there's, there's a trajectory here. And it's also going to be true of the disciples. So far in the book of Mark, like we've really given the disciples a hard time, man. They're never getting it. All right? But, but we're about to turn in this part of the book where they're starting to get who Jesus is. And they understand fully after his death and resurrection. It takes them a little bit, but they get there. So here's the thing about spiritual sight. Sometimes you're on the way. Sometimes you might not be there all the way yet. That's okay. God is still at work. But the main point is this. We are going to have our spiritual insight when Jesus opens our eyes. And we can see clearly the work he is doing all around us. So, my encouragement to you this week is to first desire and then authentically ask God to open our eyes. To first desire and then authentically ask God to open our eyes to the spiritual reality around us, that he is alive and at work in our world today all around us. Now, I I say desire and ask uh, for that spiritual openness, and we'll talk about that in a second, but I do also want to say this. We have a very gracious God, and sometimes he doesn't wait for us to ask. Sometimes he just shows us grace and opens our eyes to things even before we could ask him, and that's a blessing. But we see a pattern in the story here that we should ask. We should desire God to open our eyes, that we shouldn't just sit back and maybe hope he does someday, but to, to kind of actively pursue that. And if I were to walk through the sandwich again, I think we see this. We have the deaf man who comes to Jesus and his friends are begging Jesus, right? They are authentically asking Jesus, we believe you have the power to do this. Please heal this man. And his ears are open and his spiritual understanding of who Jesus is grows. Then we have the disciples. They showed no desire to d- dwell into kind of the spiritual realm of what was happening around them and the first part of that feeding miracle. And so their eyes were not opened. You get to the Pharisees, who definitely didn't want to understand, didn't want to have their world wrecked, had no desire, and made no authentic ask of Jesus. And that's where the authentic comes from, because did, did the Pharisees ask a sign for Jesus? Yeah, they did. Did they mean it? No, not really. They'd already seen enough signs. There's no more signs that they could see that was going to convince them beside what Jesus had already done. So they asked, but it wasn't an authentic ask. Then we have Jesus kind of confronting the disciples on their lack of understanding. And again, for them, worried about bread, worried about the concerns of this world, kind of blinding themselves to the spiritual reality, not a desire or an authentic ask. And then we get to, again, our last healing story where the man's eyes are open, the two-part healing. Not only is there a desire, but this authentic ask and trust in Jesus. And so here's the deal. If you ask God this week to open your eyes, if you ask him to show you how he was working right around you and the people you know at school, well, not school anymore, it's summer. Is everyone on summer now? There's probably like three college students that are taking some summer classes, but except for them, right? So maybe not students, but like your, your coworkers, you're like, you're going to see, if you ask God for that spirit, you're going to see him working ways you never saw before. He's going to show you. You need to open yourself up to God showing you how he is at work all around us. I, I, I've recently, just in the last couple of weeks, I've had multiple conversations where this has happened exactly for some people. Can't share the details of the story because some of these things are kind of still in process, but there's one family I, I know and I'm friends with, I really care about, uh, and they've been having uh, some really deep struggles uh, with uh, their uh, adult son. And, and over the last couple of weeks, some of these things have started coming to a head. And one of the things they were asking me to pray for them as they were kind of addressing some of these issues 
uh, was, you know, we, we pray that we would see what's happening like spiritually here. Because we think it's more than just kind of the earthly circumstances of what's happening. And I think they were right. And as they asked God to do that, they really saw clearly, they saw where God was acting and working. They saw where there was evil kind of coming into the situation. Uh, and just within the last couple of days, that adult son was baptized and they addressed their issue with, with prayer and by going to God and with, by sharing the gospel. And God opened their eyes and they saw their problem and their struggle from a new perspective. And God did amazing things for them and, and amongst them. Know another family is struggling with a medical issue that's really caused a lot of problems for their family. Uh, and they, again, were, were a family who were, who were willing to say, Lord, show us what is really happening here. Like, is there something, are we missing a piece of this? Is this more than just like a medical problem? And, and I think there was. I think there was a kind of a spiritual battle happening here along with the actual real medical issue. And they began praying about the situation. Not only did it bring them incredible comfort to do that, but they saw a huge change in the family member who they were praying for, who was struggling. And as soon as they turned to Jesus, there was a change. Still medical stuff to work out, but the situation was completely different. Sorry I have to tell you these vague stories. That's just where these stories are. But it just kept happening to me this week as I'm reading about God. God, open my eyes to the spiritual things that are happening around me. And then these, these people just come to me with these stories. And I'm like, that's, that's what this looks like. It's important for us to ask God this. Because if not, every struggle we face seems insurmountable. Every problem in our society seems like it's doom. In gloom, which I've talked a lot over the past couple years, everything we see makes us anxious or angry, or both, if I'm talking about myself. But when we ask God to open our eyes, we see even in the midst of some of those terrible circumstances, even in the midst of societal problems, we see how God is working out his plan of redemption all around us. So this week, desire and ask God to open up your eyes, to see things from his perspective, to see how he is at work, working out his plan of redemption, both in our victories and through our struggles. He's there. He's working. And he will show us when we ask him, let's pray that he does that. Heavenly Father, you are faithful to help us. You are there and alive and at work. And I pray, Lord, for each one of us here that you would open our eyes to the spiritual reality, that you are at work, that you are active all around us, that you're even working in the midst of our big societal issues. You are working in the politics and the gas prices. Somehow, Lord, Reveal that to us. Show us, Lord, how you are changing lives all around us. Show us how you are helping heal those who need healing. Show us how you are helping those who are in need. Show us as you carry your people along. Show us where you are supernaturally at work, where the only explanation is that you are active in changing the lives of people who trust in you. Open up our eyes.